Hi John, thanks for coming to the GMB Novice and Irish Regional Office here in Liverpool uh, to talk with us today for the GMB Young Members Mental Health Campaign. Well, thanks for asking me, Ross. Yeah. Right. Glad to be here. Yeah. And uh, it'll be great to hear your thoughts and expertise as a Union Support Officer for North West TUC uh, for our campaign, uh, particularly about mental health in the workplace uh, and in society as well. But obviously our campaign is quite focused on uh, young people's mental health um, as well as the impact of our austerity and welfare reform on this as well. Uh, and what trade unions and employers can do more to tackle this soaring crisis in mental health, uh, both in the workplace and in society. Okay, yeah, good. It's good to hear. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, it's, it's going well so far. So uh, yeah, I think this will be really good to you know to, to give our members and our activists um, really the idea of, of if they want to do something about mental health and the campaigns and so on in their workplaces, just exactly how to do that and how to, to approach you know these issues. Okay. Yeah. So to start off with. Um, can you give us, our uh, members, a bit of an idea about what the TUC is working on at the moment in mental health? Yeah, um, it's um, a, a, what you might call an, a developing or emerging picture from mm. the TUC's point of view. The TUC has long had an interest in mental health, um, has seen it um, in terms of what representatives are able to do in the workplace to support people with those issues. Uh, or who are suffering from a variety of conditions or where workplaces are uh, have particular problems around issues to do with mental health and has seen the role of health and safety reps as being pivotal in this regard and in fact the legislation and the role of health and safety reps is um, very well developed in terms of being able to deal with issues to do with mental health however in historical terms we've only had health and safety reps for like 40 years, something mm -hmm. like that, um, and there's a really big job for health and safety reps to do about getting rid of accidents and stopping deaths in the workplace and reducing all of those kind of real problems. And so obviously quite a lot of the focus for health and safety reps is on that kind of thing. Um, and legislation's kind of caught up with the practice of trade unions. You know, where trade unions have led the way in challenging some of the practices in workplaces, they often have resulted in legislation following that and, and making workplaces safer. So we're in a situation where I wouldn't by any means say that workplaces are entirely safe, but we have done quite a lot of work around issues to do with accidents and safety in the workplace. And yet the role of a health and safety rep includes issues to do with welfare or well-being in the workplace. So the TUC kind of followed on from the natural role of health and safety reps and try to inform them about how they can expand their activity to include issues to do with mental health um, and issues like stress and so on in the workplace. So being the, the appropriate kind of officer or rep, the health and safety rep has been the kind of subject of the education for it. But also the CUC has in common with some other unions seen how broad this picture is around mental health and has sought to bring new activists into uh, activity around health and well-being and health and welfare issues in the workplace. So we've got people who are not health and safety reps also interested in the issue now. So for a number of years the TUC has been running mental health awareness courses. They started off as a two-day course which was to kind of inform people who were interested. Largely health and safety reps but not entirely. There'd be bargaining reps and union learning reps and other kinds of uh, activists who would be interested in that. But it was largely to kind of inform them about the, the issues, what what mental health was and, and you know what mental health was and what you should find in the workplace and what the responsibilities of the employer are, what services are out there, what range of conditions you might encounter. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of an awareness thing. And then it developed into well how do you negotiate around it? How do you do fun practical things in the workplace to make the workplace better for people who might have mental health conditions or yeah. to prevent the workplace changing into a toxic environment. Yeah, to keep it positive. Lots of people right, yeah. are. So it's gone into a three-day course fairly quickly. Okay. Um, so it's a three-day course now um, that the TUC does about mental health in the workplace. And in different bits of the country, people like me who've taken an interest in uh, mental health have done more work in respect of making connections with local practitioners in the field of mental health or doing things like uh, becoming qualified to deliver additional mm. courses or additional trainings to trade unions. So for example, I'm a licensed mental health first aid trainer. 
which means that I can teach people to be mental health first aiders in the workplace. There's a colleague up in the North East who's doing that and another guy up in Cumbria uh, who, who also can do that. Um, our uh, national team down in London have been developing policy content and just recently there's been two really uh, interesting publications uh, produced. Um, one is a guide based on the mental health awareness course. There's an update around mental health in the workplace, quite a detailed pra practical kind of guide to what you might do in the workplace in respect of um, mental health. That's a, a good um, publication. It's only just come out now in the last month or so. And then uh, another publication about health and well-being in the workplace, which is far more of a policy-oriented um, discussion, has just been reproduced and updated. Um, and that's just been published as well. We launched both of them at um, a health, safety and wellbeing conference in Manchester a little over a month ago and the demand for them is enormous. So we've now got lots of people kind of engaging with the issue yeah. and beginning to say, well, what can we do in our workplace with it? And we now have, through our practice and through some of the information and guides and tutoring content, got something useful to say to them and we've got people like me who are active in various regions actually can act as the link with a union who wants to do something about it. So we've begun to start to equip ourselves to support unions all the better in terms of mental health. So it's a kind of developing uh, approach and there's particular um, events and particular departures and particular uh, practices that we've done in different parts of the country and I can speak yeah. for what we've been doing in the North West but the, the big picture is is that we are gearing up to do the broadest possible level of support that we can to unions but we recognise that it's got to be unions who yeah. do it and unions know their members better so we won't take the place of unions right. but we'll help them it was come down and to get some yeah. yeah. So what's been the reception like in your, in your mental health first aid courses for grants? You do believe you, you come down soon to you know to do a mental health first aid course. Yeah. Um, well look, the course I'm doing here is, is in a, a one day course mm. um, talking about the practical things you might do in the workplace if you want to address the issue of mental health. Yeah. And that's here, here GMB, Yeah, that's what's the GMB. I'm just doing a one day for the GMB and that. Uh, mental health first aid course itself is a two-day course and it's um, licensed by Mental Health First Aid England. It's a kind of, no one else can deliver it except people sanctioned by Mental Health First Aid England. It's a bit, you know, they kind of have the monopoly on that in, yeah. in the sense of they're the ones who do all the underpinning research and the work and they get all the materials together and so on. So if you deliver that course, you're delivering it to their standard and you're delivering their content. And that's a two-day course and that's different in a sense from the three day course that TUC does and it's different from the one that I'm doing from the GMB but the reception to all of those is really positive. Mm. It's one of those issues that if people get involved in it they do so for a reason, it's either because they can see it around them in the workplace and they know that they could do better or they could do more or things that are going on shouldn't be going on or they feel as if there's a bit of a gap in what they do for their members, their colleagues and so on and they want to learn how to do it. So in my experience and the experience of other colleagues who are involved with this, it's an entirely positive response. The TUC research itself says that you know, one in six British workers are affected by mental health conditions such as anxiety, depression and stress and the increasing number of work, young workers among them you know, saying that they're starting to experience mental health problems. And you know, there's the economic <coughs> as well for, for employers that you know, the associated cost of poor mental health in the workplace is now nearly amounting to £26 million pounds a year. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to hear your thoughts on, on you know, is there anything you think that is behind this sort of soaring social and economic uh, figures coming out uh, around mental health? Uh, and also, do you think it, this is affected by the, the current economic climate? It is uh, austerity and the, you know, the, the current economic measures that the government's putting in, and especially the workplaces. Is this having a, a, an added effect um, on, on these issues? Yeah. Um, well, to start with the last one first, I'm, I'm not an economics expert, so I couldn't give you the kind of precision no. that you might need in terms of being able to show you a map that shows it. But it seems to me. Um, entirely intuitive that if you've got a situation where in the workplace um, there's been reduction in headcount, 
there's been um, an increase in the amount of work that individuals are having to do in order for the workplace to be able to deal with the economic reality confronting it, whether it's a public sector, local authority or hospital or you know, uh, whatever other public sector body it is, which is subject to a decrease of budget from central government and therefore the pressures downwards on headcounts and on the workload are clear. Or whether it's a private sector firm which is responding to global market conditions and having to make things cheaper, quicker, with inferior materials or whatever they're doing in order to respond, that pressure can play you know, its part in uh, adding to the stress and, and therefore the associated and corollary conditions that people will face. So it seems entirely clear to me that that's mm. the case. And if you look at the figures, it is suggestive that you know, the increase in mental health has gone up in areas where um, those kind of things in the economy have been playing through as well. So uh, just as an example, we did, um, it's a couple of years ago now, in a local authority in the northwest, um, we did with the employer and with the unions, GMB was prime, prime amongst, amongst them, uh, a survey of members of staff about health generally. And the employer started with the perspective that they'll come, come across things like obesity and that they would want to offer fitness programs mm -hmm. and so on for people. So they kind of had that, and, but our position, the unions and our position was, we think that you'll find something to do with stress here because you've been subject to downward pressure on your resources, which has resulted in you either cutting jobs but the work's still there, yeah. or adding to the workload of people. So we wouldn't be surprised if you get figures that suggest that. And we got figures that suggested that 60% of people in that local authority were feeling stressed, either because of additional work or reduced staffing. Um, we've got those figures, and that, those figures yeah. are pretty clear to us. And so from that point of view, we were able to say to the employer, well, great doing the fitness stuff, that's brilliant, but you really do need to think about how you are responding to the cuts mm -hmm. and what, what the impact of that in terms of your policies internally are on your staff. But if you only concentrate on absences, you miss something called presenteeism. And the Centre for Mental Health reckons that presenteeism, which is effectively coming to work when you shouldn't be, mm. and we'll discuss why you might do that, costs British businesses 1.5 times more than absences do, and yet businesses are fixated on absence mm. management, well they'd be better fixating on presenteeism. And the thing is, when you talk about presenteeism, you talk about, you've got to understand why people will come to work when they're ill and shouldn't be at work. Quite often it's because they're afraid, they're scared that if they come in, you know, if they don't come into work, that the absence management approach will capture them and they'll be up for the high jump or they're committed to their colleagues because they see the pressure everybody's under mm. and you know if we don't stick together and work this job through we're in trouble we lose our job so I'll come into work even when I'm not because what bigger than it is and it becomes you know you can't switch off you exactly it's yeah. just yeah and, and and then therefore you talk about people who are in work who are not as productive as they could be because they're not really well no. You know, they're suffering from stress, anxiety, other conditions. Mm. You know, they might be suffering from depression, they might be suffering from any number of other conditions. They may have physical ailments, but they're still coming into work. Either because of commitment to their colleagues, or because they're afraid, or because the culture kind of says, you know, mm. if your act's not hanging off, you're in work. Well, yeah. and, and often that culture itself then plays out and yeah, makes people right. ill as well. So. We need to get employers to start thinking about that and that's what we did with that local authority. We said to them, mm. you need to start thinking about this issue. You've clearly got lots of people who are in work, but 60% of them are suggesting that they're suffering from stress. Mm. So what is it you're going to do about that? Because you've got a problem with presenteeism. and they're in work, but they're not being as productive as they could be, and they're not well. So you've got a duty to do something about that. And in fact, from an economic point of view, you'd be really well advised to do it. So because it's costing the yeah, so it's exactly. Right. So yeah. this issue about the economy and that is complex, mm. but we clearly can see how the impact of exactly. economic change plays its way through in the workplace and then and makes people ill. Mm. So from our point of view, as trade unionists, we have to protect and support our people, and that's why we're interested in the issue at all. Yeah. So we have to factor in considerations of 
you know, what's the economic situation like for this employer and where is it playing its way mm. through to the workplace of management and the culture, and, you know, mm. absence rates, presenteeism rates and so on. So it's, there's clearly a link. Yeah. And we need to deal with it on a kind of workplace base. Yeah. And from a TUC perspective, um, what do you think trade unions can do to help raise awareness, provide support on mental health at work and in society? Um, I, I'm slightly hesitant to kind of appear to be telling the trade unions. Oh, no, 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 yeah, uh, your thoughts and ideas, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I think in terms of what the TUC can do, we, mm. we already are doing some of those things in terms of doing some of the kind of policy work and the research and, and kind of generating some really important areas for discussion for trade unions around issues to do with well-being in the workplace and health and mental health and so on. So I think we, we can do that and kind of invite unions to take part in that discussion with us. I think we can adapt our training programme, which clearly we've tried to do with mental health um, training, uh, you know, awareness training in, in, in the workplace. And I think the other thing that the TUC and unions can do together is to find ways in which we can link with a whole range of different partners and people who are interested in and can contribute to our better understanding of the issues. So we can generate a, a bigger, broader, more supportive network to help us to understand what the issues are and how we can deal mm. with them and then to start implementing good practice that we've learned from wherever we get the information from or from other countries or from certain workplaces who've already started to do some of these things. One of the things that we think unions should be doing is, is finding out as much as they possibly can about the field, about the area of mental health. and together with the knowledge that they have of their members and their workplaces, have a look at how some of this better understanding that they've got through mm. the research and through the um, contact with a broader network can be applied to supportive practice for their members. So for example, um, if you, to use the example I used earlier, we did that survey of a local authority. If we um, use that survey to inform what we do in the next local authority or the one after that, we've already learned something from one area of practice and from, from that. So we would know that if we went to a, a local authority 10 miles away, we're likely to see a similar picture. Yeah. So without, without having necessarily to repeat the, the research, anything that we found in authority A to be useful we could simply transplant into Authority B. So where a union is engaged in this kind of research and analysis and learning about the issue, it can quickly build up some good practice which then becomes, this is how we do mental health in you know, whatever kind of employer it is. If you took an employer in, in the health sector, for example, and you wanted to do something about membership in the health sector and their health, you would find that any hospital trust is much like another in terms of the composition, makeup, services, responsibilities, the economic pressures on them and so on. So you would have a set of good practices that you could simply take to another workplace and mean that you could do things quicker, you could probably hit more people more uh, readily, you'd, you'd be able to cover a whole range of issues better six months down the line than you did when you first started out. So, Really, this is a plea for unions to kind of take opportunities to learn as much as they can about good practice, to integrate some of the support and knowledge and learning you can get from some of the partners that are out there, and there's some really good partners who've got quite a good track record in terms of dealing with this issue, and then translate that into the workplace. And it could come down to, for example, a union branch might commit itself to saying, well, in every workplace we want someone who's done mental health first aid training or in every workplace we want somebody to have at least done the TUC's three day mental health awareness course. In every workplace we want to work with the employer on a health and well-being or health and welfare, whatever it's called, um, steering group to address issues like absenteeism, presenteeism, the general health of people, the problems that they've got with you know, mental health and so on. Mental health in itself is an issue that nobody really wants to talk about.
No, it's one of those kind of hidden issues. Yeah, to be you subjective. Know, yeah, use an example. If, if you and I played football together and uh, we went into where you haven't broken your leg, I'd be having a good laugh with them. And I say, you know what he'd done? He tripped over the ball, he broke his leg, and then you'd have a few days off, a few weeks off, and you'd come in, you'd probably plaster on your leg or something like that. And you're everybody's mate, and everybody wants to slap you on the back or take the mickey out of you and, mm. and have a good laugh about it. And your kind of integration back into the workplace is based upon a visible illness which everybody accommodates. But if you have a nervous breakdown, so-called, or if you have a wobble in terms of mental health or the stress has got to you so much that you kind of have a blow up and then you take some time off and you come back into work, you'll find a very different picture. People yeah. kind of like, better not say anything to him because it might set them off again or I don't know how to talk about mm -hmm. it. He's not talking about it because you don't know how to talk about your illness to someone else. You might feel shame, you might feel fear, you, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know how to have a proper conversation about it. So gets brushed under the carpet, it gets hidden. So we need to learn how to change the workplace so that people can have a conversation about their mental health, which is just the same as the conversation they've had about their broken leg. Yeah. We need to be able to challenge stigma, we need to be able to make the idea that disclosing a mental health condition is not something to be afraid of. Yeah. We need to create the conditions where that's real. It's not real now. Many people will not disclose. Something like 75% of people won't disclose to their employer that they've got a mental health condition or that they've been suffering a mental health condition. So when employers are recording absences, they're not getting an honest picture. No. Because lots of people say, oh, I had a bad back, but really it was something else. It may well have been a mental health condition, and they're not prepared to tell. If you're worse than it, because you feel like you, you can't you know, open up. Or yeah, because the culture doesn't support yeah. it. And so, we will break that culture and make inroads into that culture mm. after we do the practical stuff and we take, you know, learn from other organisations what they can tell us about mental health, learn from the practices of workplaces which you're already doing a bit, learn from our own kind of understanding in terms of doing the surveys we're doing, interrogating our membership and asking them what the issues are, making it safe for people to have proper conversations about issues like this build up an understanding of our workplaces and then start tackling practical things in the workplace so that over time the culture will change with it. Yeah. And I know of a workplace in the North West, I, I won't tell you the name of them on camera, but um, this is a, a workplace where when they started talking about having a, a mental health programme as part of a health and wellbeing programme, the unions resisted it and said, no, I'm not happy about this. Don't, this doesn't look good to us. Mm. We're not having you poking your nose into all this kind of thing. And for good reason, you know, the yeah. employer was um, seemingly positive about something which had never been discussed before yeah. in any level of detail. And the unions were a bit like, why are they doing this? What's this about? Mm. So there was a degree of suspicion. And, and then amongst the members, you know, that's the, the officers and reps were thinking that. And the membership themselves were a bit like, whoa, I don't know about that. You've now got a situation where that employer has got uh, an in-house counselling service so that anybody who's suffering um, from a mental health condition which can be supported through counselling or talking yeah. therapies can get an appointment. Right. And you've now got a situation, it's a male dominated mm -hmm. workforce, uh, you've got a situation where and men don't talk about these things, no, which is another issue we'll yeah, yeah. to in a minute, where if me and you support, you know, uh, football teams and um, we're working shifts um, I might say to you, do you know what, I've got an appointment with the councillor on Thursday afternoon um, but I want to go to match Thursday night and you know, it's going to take me about four hours. Any chance you swap your appointment with me? So people, are men are swapping appointments with a psychotherapist openly and mm -hmm. without free fear or fretting about you know, the stigma yes, or any kind of well. sense. And that's a real cultural shift. Yeah. But it came about because of practical engagement between the union and the employer who sat down and said, let's talk about these issues properly. Let's be plain about them. We've done a survey of our members. We know this is the situation for them. You know it's costing you money. You, we know your managers are not equipped to deal with it, so let's get some training in for your managers. Let's train some of our reps up. Let's start tackling these issues practically and usefully together and then therefore, you know, over time we'll, we'll make an improvement. 
So, say I'm a rep, and um, so you know, I've watched this video, for example, or I've, I've heard something um, about doing more mental health in the workplace. I, I want to get involved. I want to, to, you know, to, to, do, to do so. So, what would be my, what, what would you think my first decision should be? Or where should I go to? You okay. know, I think if you're a rep, you're likely to be connected to a branch structure yes. or some other kind of structure within the union where you can surface issues, you can raise issues, and so on. And if you just kind of happen to get interested in it, you can either start thinking about what you might do in the workplace, or you might go to your branch and start discussing with colleagues from other workplaces or from other bits of that workplace, however your branch is structured, um, what you might do collectively. Um, and it would be better if you came to it collectively, if a group of you started thinking about the issue together, because that's where you get better ideas mm -hmm. and more kind of creativity when you start talking about it as a group. But if you're left to your own devices, you've got, you know, you've got to really think about, well, what can I do next and what, what should I do? And if it's a workplace issue, that's manifested itself and made you think about it. You need to equip yourself fairly quickly with some tools and some um, kind of uh, knowledge and learning that will enable you to deal with that issue. But if it's something that hasn't happened yet, but you suspect is lying dormant and you need mm. to get, get to grips with it, you've got a little bit more time and you can start to plan how you might deal with it. But in all cases, the, 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 the key thing is just to kind of raise it with whoever your next kind of reporting line is in the union and talk to your branch, talk to your convener if you're a rep, talk to your colleagues who are other reps and say, you know, this is an issue, I've found this, what about have you found it or I've heard something or I've seen this video, don't you think we should do something about it? Try to get a bigger group than just yourself dealing with it. And that then helps your union to offer a service to you because it will be able to offer the service to more people so it makes it easier to do, um, cheaper to do and so on if it involves training. So if you can get a group of people together who can learn how to understand issues to do with mental health, then you'll be able to put on a mental health awareness course, which is a three-day course you can you can do with the TUC, or you can deliver the course. You, you know, if your union is the union that is a union that delivers its own training, we'll be able to deliver the course itself. It might bring in TUC, or it might just do it entirely through its own lay tutors or its own education officers. But the union can give some training and some support, which is quite a lot of detail about what you might do in respect to that. So you begin to get some kind of concrete knowledge that will enable you to do more. You then find out a way of surfacing the issue in the workplace, if it's a workplace issue. How would we deal with this? Is the employer interested? And mine, the mental health charity, for example, has done really good detailed surveys of employers and they found that over half of employers want to do something about these issues, but have got no clue how to start doing them. Mm. They just don't know how That's to deal with it. Well, why shouldn't unions show them? So from our point of view, we learn, we understand what good practice is, we want to represent our members, we know that in some cases there's an open door, unions, the employers want us to kind of come knocking on the door. You know, in other cases, you, the employer is not interested mm. at all. But you might be fortunate enough to have an employer who wants to talk to you about it. So once you've got your act together and you a bit more concrete understanding of what you can do, then go to the employer and say, okay, let's do something together in here. You can then start putting in safeguards and good practice so that your, your, your colleagues and your members trust that what you're doing is not going to make them unsafe. It's not going to make them have to worry about absence management, identifying them. It's not going to make them disclose things before they're ready to do so, not going to expose them to kind of ridicule or any of those kind of things. You then start to change slowly the practices you've got in the workplace so that you can start to deal with mental health issues in the workplace. And that might mean, in some cases, that you actually make work better for everybody. Yeah. In a environment. positive workplace environment. Very positive yeah. environment, because that's clearly the underlying underpinning objective is to improve the workplace. Work is good for you, but not just any old work. Not just, you know, some rubbish job on low, low income and poor terms and conditions. It's good for you when it's good work, when it fulfills you, when it makes you feel like you're making a contribution, when you feel rewarded, when you've got 
good quality working relationships where you don't feel harassed, bullied or pressured and strained and stressed, that's when work's good for you. And that's really our objective as trade unions, to make work like that for everyone. Yeah. Where it's not, we know that there are consequences, some of which are mental health problems. Learn how to deal with them. We'll be doing what we should be doing as trade unionists.